Good evening, everyone. So I think we'll get started. Um, my name is Crystal Jacob. I am a proud supporter of the Lois Hole Hospital for Women Women's Society. I'm also co-chair of our development committee. For those of you who don't know, the Lois Hole Hospital for Women Women's Society is a group of women in all ages and stages of life, passionate about and committed to raising excellence in women's health care and treatment. The Women's Society raises awareness and important funds for a variety of initiatives for the hospital. Um, and we host our mind and body talks as an inclusive speaking experience to engage and stay commit, um, connected with our community. Um, before we dive into tonight's session, though, I am just going to go over a few housekeeping um, notes for us. So as you can see, we are in um, speaker mode. So you don't have to worry about your cameras at all. You will see the speaker who is speaking pop up on your screen. Um, tonight, we are honored to have Dr. Lisa Hornberger and Dr. Tanya Berry with us, um, as well as patient representative Kelly Opper. We are hoping you will come away from this presentation from these two experienced researchers and patient advocate feeling educated about their efforts and affect change um, and excited about their progress so far. This is a safe space for all to come and have questions answered. Um, and at the end of the session, we will have a Q&A period, um, which we will answer your questions live. So we ask that you place any questions you have in the chat box and we will get to them at the end. Um, my co-chair, Rhiannon, will be hosting our Q&A for this evening. We are using the live transcript mode as well. If you would like to follow along with this, you just have to enable this on your personal computer. I will let you know that we will be posting tonight's seminar to YouTube tomorrow. So if anyone else is interested in viewing, it will be available as soon as tomorrow for them. And in addition, we also have a survey that will be sent out at the end of the lecture. If you fill this out, you will be entered for a chance to win a $25 gift card courtesy of Alberta Blue Cross. This is not spam if you get an email for it. So open the email and respond and the gift card is yours. Um, so that's it for housekeeping this evening. But before we get started, I wanted to send our thanks to Alberta Blue Cross. They are our supporter for these events, um, and they have continued to support us over the past couple of years. And um, now Narissa will bring greetings from Blue Cross for us. Thanks so much for that warm welcome. Hi, everyone. I'm Narissa Kanji, Community Impact Manager at Alberta Blue Cross, and I want to welcome you all here to our session tonight. At Alberta Blue Cross, we're really focused on promoting the health and wellness of each Albertan and providing opportunities that allow you to live your best life. And we're so proud to be a sponsor of this fantastic series. And I'm really grateful for the Lowest Hole Women's Hospital, the Lowest Hole Hospital Women's Society for creating this warm, safe, inclusive space that allows us to come together each month to talk about our health, mind and body and really put it as a priority. So I'm really excited to hear from our speakers here tonight and really understand more about all matters of the health. And I think we're gonna walk away with a great understanding of our heart, but also the importance of women's health research and why we should continue to be advocates for it. So thank you so much for being part of our session here tonight and attending. Before I pass it on, I do wanna do a land acknowledgement. Today and every day, we respectfully acknowledge that we are on the traditional lands referred to as Treaty 6 territory. We recognize that the city of Edmonton and us, the people here, are beneficiaries of the Peace and Friendship Treaty. Treaty 6 encompasses the traditional territories of numerous Western Canadian First Nations, such as the Cree, Salto, Blackfoot, Métis, Dimi, and Nakota Sioux. We're taking the important moment here to acknowledge all the very many First Nation, Métis, and Inuit people whose footsteps have marked these lands for centuries. Thank you so much. Awesome, thank you for that, Narissa. 
I now have the honor of introducing our speakers to you this evening, starting with Tegan Gaylor, VP Fund Development and Stakeholder Engagement from the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation to speak about this evening's event and the connection between tonight's feature partners, Wickery, the Women and Children's Research Institute, and Alberta Women's Health Foundation. Wonderful, thank you, Crystal, and good evening, everyone. I'd like to say a heartfelt thank you to Alberta Blue Cross as well. Thank you for sponsoring this event and being able to share this wonderful education to our broader community. So I'm very excited about this evening and this collaboration event that we have. So this event is really made possible by a collaboration, as Crystal mentioned, with the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, the Women and Children's Health Research Institute, and the Lowellsville Hospital Women's Society. And the whole purpose of this event is to share really important uh, health research findings and outcomes, and really how we support women at all ages and all stages of their life. The Alberta Women's Health Foundation is a division of the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation. And really the purpose of the Alberta Women's Health Foundation is to fund women's health research. And we know research is big and complex, but we have a wonderful team in partnership with WICRI uh, to tackle these issues in our community and really to lift up women and children. So tonight we're very excited to share with you uh, some research uh, that is currently being funded uh, through WICRI in the space of women's heart health. And further to that, uh, we have a patient advocate here, Kelly Offer. And not only is Kelly Offer a patient advocate, she's also a staff member of the Royal Alexandra Hospital Foundation. And so just goes to show how our mission uh, touches all of us and the support we have in our community. So I'm very much looking forward to the talk this evening uh, and I'm happy to pass it back to Crystal and I will follow up again uh, after Kelly's uh, speech today. Perfect, thank you for that introduction, Tegan. Um, I now have the honor of introducing our first guest speaker and that will be Dr. Lisa Hornberger. Dr. Hornberger is a professor in the Division of Pediatric Cardiology at the University of Alberta and the Director of Fetal and Neonatal Cardiology Program at the Stollery Children's Hospital. Her research focuses on prenatal diagnosis management and outcome of cardiovascular, sorry for that, uh, cardiovascular disorders detected in utero in an effort to optimize pregnancy outcomes on how early insults in life before and after birth may impact long-term heart and blood vessel health and defining how well our healthcare performs pre and postnatally for socially and geographically disadvantaged children with congenital heart disease to reduce discrepancies in care and thus outcomes. So welcome Dr. Hornberger. Uh Perfect. I, thank you so much for having me. This is really um, a lovely opportunity to, to be able to show uh, the foundation what their, their uh, support has uh, led to, and, and it's quite exciting. I'm going to show you a little bit of what we've done over the years, actually, of support that actually is changing practice uh, and certainly contributing to optimized care and then optimized care in the long, uh, long term as well. So thank you very much for, for having me. So I, I thought I'd start with a little bit of who were we and then who we are now. So we were initiated, in fact, in the fall of 2008. And prior to that time, what we provided in the way of service for fetal assessments from a heart perspective were performed at the Stoller Echo Lab. And there were only about 350 to 450 studies per year. We had no dedicated machines or space, no dedicated fetal cardiology faculty, no dedicated fellows, nurses or research personnel. But in fact, today in 2022, we're nationally and internationally recognized for our vibrant clinical service with performing over 2,300 fetal echocardiograms for women all over uh, Alberta uh, and beyond. Strong training program and we matriculate two to three clinical research fellows every year, as well as 
many grad and undergraduate students, educational outreach work that's optimizing uh, diagnoses in utero, and then the innovative work, research productivity, and you'll get a taste of that uh, tonight. Really, I have to start by saying none of this would be possible without foundation support. So we are incredibly grateful, my colleagues and I, my, and as well as our trainees and students are incredibly grateful to the donors uh, uh, that have actually made it possible for us to provide this kind of service and to, to improve the care of our patients. So what do we do? We provide fetal echocardiograms for, for uh, pregnancies that are at risk for structural, functional, and rhythm-related fetal heart disease in all of Northern Alberta and Northwest Territories. We also, when there is a diagnosis of a heart defect that requires uh, delivery in a surgical center, in fact, we have patients that come from all over Alberta, parts of Saskatchewan and BC, and at times other parts of our, our Western provinces for care of fairly acutely unwell newborns after a fetal diagnosis. So that's kind of where we start. Um, we provide prenatal counseling. We work closely with our specialists in maternal fetal medicine and obstetrics to coordinate other testing. We participate in multidisciplinary meetings, including uh, meetings across Alberta and with our patients that are on the bordering uh, provinces. And then we plan perinatal and neonatal management of these babies. So this gives you a little bit of a taste of what we do every day to make sure those babies get good care, those moms get good care, and it results in a good outcome for the families. So, but also the other things that we do, and you're going to see a bit of this with the research, we train future clinicians and researchers in fetal and neonatal cardiology. And this is included over the last 10 years, over 90 published research papers involving our trainees and students, many as first authors, as well as book chapters, uh, and over 100 scientific abstracts presented in national and international conferences. And there's just some pictures of some of our trainees uh, that have been supported. In fact, our trainees go off to be uh, practicing in many parts of the world, uh, including much of North America, but you could see that we have had um, uh, as well an impact elsewhere in the world where people are actually leading programs and doing better for those patients as well. And at the end of the day, I think that that uh, in fact is expanding the impact of the foundations as well as the hospitals involved. So getting on to the research. So there have been many research initiatives that have been facilitated by uh, the Alberta Women's Health uh, foundation um, that includes the evolving role of first trimester fetal echo, making early diagnoses and, and providing insight into the early circulation, prenatal predictors of, of small lungs in babies so that we're better uh, for, uh, counseling and uh, also improving the care of these babies after birth uh, and the impact of maternal placental health on the cardiovascular health of the fetus, infant and child with specific areas of fetal hypoxia maternal diabetes, and more recently, maternal heart disease. I'll give you a little taste of that. The first trimester work is what we've been doing for many years. We're recognized for this across North America, and in fact, internationally. And we, we started this back in 2009, 2010 with support from the foundation, and it has only grown. Uh, we started looking at how good is this at eight to 14 weeks. So this is when the baby's just a tiny little thing um, uh, for fetal heart screening and for diagnosing fetal heart disease. Uh, really providing uh, more time for families for other testing and to learn of the baby's condition. Uh, and just as a start, this is when we start, eight weeks all the way up to 14 weeks. These are what we're talking about, very, very early diagnoses where we're really seeing four chambers of the heart. And then by 13 weeks, the heart looks a little bit more of what we see a little later on. The size of the heart at the stage is that of a lentil, just to put it in perspective. And this one's the size of a pea. It also has helped us understand developmental changes in fetal heart function and what might or might not be tolerated by the fetal circulation. We've also been exploring how mom's disease affects early fetal heart function and, and structure. And to date, we have recruited over 700 pregnancies as a consequence of what uh, was started back in 2009, 2010 with the support. This is just to give you an idea. We've looked at, we're, we're recognized for having provided insight into the development of the heart as well as when to screen. So here's a four chamber heart at eight weeks. And this is when it's about the size of a lentil at nine and a half weeks. This is more like 11 weeks, 12 weeks, and then we're on to when we're 14 weeks. And you can see as you get further along, the heart looks a bit more um, visible and understandable. Uh, but in fact, this is a, a period of incredibly rapid growth, as you can see uh, through these hearts uh, up above. And we've published quite a bit. Dr. McBrien is one of my colleagues uh, uh, who has published quite a bit on this with me.
over the years and with our program. We've reported how and when to screen these early hearts, and we found best at 12 to 14 weeks, but we recognize there's limitations. And now this data that has been uh, gathered over the last several years through this fund funding um, is in fact incorporated into North American uh, guidelines. So people across North America in all programs, uh, fetal cardiology programs are gonna be using this data uh, to actually be uh, uh, providing service for their patients, for their moms. Uh, and what we found is basically, again, at 12 beyond is when we really see most of the structures, this is the four chambers of the heart, the great vessels of the heart are much better seen uh, later with the, with the stripes being the color flow through those or having some sense of the flow through them. And this is the aortic and ductal arches where we're again seeing them better uh, in the 12th uh, through 14th week. Um, my colleague, and we've, we've published this, my colleague, uh, this is a, a former fellow of ours who actually runs the biggest, uh, Dr. Darren Hutchinson, uh, the biggest uh, fetal cardiovascular unit in Australia now. So we've also made diagnoses and we've now taught people to do this. We've published on it. Uh, this is an example of a 12 week fetus who's only about an inch size from head to bum where we're seeing really significant structural problems uh, and the heart in fact is in the right side of the chest and beating very slowly. This baby is not gonna do very well, but we can provide that information for the families and have a bit more information about what is happening and, and anticipate what's gonna happen. This is maybe with transposition of the great vessels. The two vessels are coming off the wrong ventricles. This is a very common diagnosis that we're seeing before birth. Uh, and preparing the family for this also allows us to prepare as well, uh, not only the family, actually the baby to be ready for that baby to be delivered. This is a diagnosis made even as early as 13 weeks, which is incredible. And then you have a common AV septal defect, very abnormal crux of the heart in this 11 week baby, very, very tiny baby who also has trisomy 21 or Down syndrome. So we're making these diagnoses quite early and we published on this to help others uh, do the same. And finally, uh, from a first trimester standpoint, we're learning lots about the fetal circulation early and trying to understand what is and isn't tolerated. I think ultimately we'll provide some clues as to why there may be early pregnancy loss, uh, as well as what's, what it has to happen for a baby to make it to term. This is just an example at eight weeks where the filling of the heart is entirely during the squeeze of the upper chamber, the atria, at super short, very high velocity. And there are these big gaps. Those big gaps we know relate to the heart function not being quite as robust. The squeeze of the heart during this period and the relaxation of the heart is not the same. And yet within weeks, you see much more, uh, a longer duration of filling of the heart that's biphasic, now starting to get early filling during that passive phase. And then you've lost those gaps. And that's because the heart ventricular function is improving so much. What we realize is the atrial function is key to all this. The atrial function probably drives the circulation very early when everyone always is focused on the ventricles. And what we've shown even further is in these very early fetuses, the atrial function squeeze Instead of just filling the heart, the ventricles, it's squeezing and, and pumping to the outflow tracts and creating some flow that's contributing to some of the output of the heart at these very early gestations. So atrial function is absolutely critical. We've gone on to show this in an animal model in a, in a little mouse. Uh, in fact, that would be the equivalent of a five to six week human what you're seeing is these are the atria. Look how robust and giant they are. They're just snapping. And whereas the ventricles are sort of slow and almost, almost like bellows at a fire, that you use in a fireplace, the little bellows, right? Um, and that's because the atrial function are super robust. Even within weeks uh, in, in, in this mouse model, it's within days. So it's from, this would be the equivalent of a five to six week human just after the heart is formed to a mid trimester human. So the middle of pregnancy, you're seeing that the ventricles now are elongated. They're squeezing much better and the atria become much less important. We've shown those changes in those gaps to go down as the function of the ventricles just augment or improve so much. And that atrial function starts off incredibly robust, incredibly snappy, becomes less important as the baby progresses. And we're now using this information to better understand how things are tolerated before uh, uh, birth later in gestation when there's pathology. This was work done by a, a gentleman, a, a cardiologist from Japan, Yozo uh, Yamamoto. We've looked at babies trying to predict small lungs in the fetus for the moms and, and, and dads for the families uh, to, to be able to anticipate what's gonna happen with the baby after birth as well as to better counsel them as to who's gonna get into trouble and who's not. So we've looked at, um, we know that many birth defects are di that are uh, uh, diagnosable before birth are associated with small lungs of the fetus. 
and you have to have lungs to breathe at before birth you don't need them but after birth they obviously are very important as the placental circulation is taken away so we've looked at many different parameters of predicting lung hypoplasia with funding through the foundation uh, this is super important for counseling and again planning for newborn care we published on 60 normal babies uh, uh, assessed before birth between 18 and 36 weeks to understand blood vessel growth, the blood vessels feeding the lungs, as well as blood flow through the lung vessels to understand how they uh, are changed with gestation, but then also how they look different when the babies have small lungs and are going to be at very high risk. And then ultimately, we used a, a fetal rat model to fur further tease out uh, predictors for these babies so that we can provide a better sense of what's going to happen with these babies. So we developed normative data that was published. And of course, our lab has lots of fun, as you can see, Dr. Yamamoto. Um, but uh, we, we developed normative data that we now can um, use to, to better assess babies at risk for small lungs. And one of the first problems we looked at is when moms rupture their membranes very early in pregnancy, uh, sometimes even in the late first trimester or early second trimester of pregnancy, it's a long period where the baby's lungs aren't getting that important fluid for lung development. And we found a certain measure of the so-called acceleration to ejection time ratio to be very abnormal in babies who don't survive as newborns. So this was actually very, very important and recently published. And you can see these red dots are the babies that in fact don't do very well. So this kind of information is incredibly helpful, both for talking with families, but also planning what those babies are gonna look like after birth and being ready to support them if we can. And we have uh, many other uh, uh, kinds of pathologies that we're looking at uh, to better tease that out for other, other uh, conditions. So finally, mom's health in pregnancy is absolutely critical to how the baby does. And it's now long been understood that exposures before birth, including over and under nutrition uh, and uh, evolution of placental pathology, where the placenta is not working really, very well, leads long-term to adult heart and metabolic disease in adults who were exposed to this before birth. And that includes heart uh, hypertrophy, fibrosis, which is like scarring, increased arterial stiffness, uh, and abnormal endothelial or flow mediated function. Those are things that relate to vascular health, diabetes and obesity. All of those are the risk. So we started looking at this to better understand when it occurs, what sort of factors are involved and what sort of things might mitigate or prevent it. So we've looked at maternal diabetes, including pregestational diabetes. This was past uh, uh, research that has been published uh, and funded by the foundation uh, that supported student summerships and a CIHR bridge funding. And we're currently looking at uh, moms uh, with gestational diabetes and looking at their children uh, to better understand their cardiovascular health and what factors uh, are important. Uh, and then finally, we, we are more recently looking at maternal heart disease that in fact is Heart and Stroke Foundation funded, but we wouldn't have been able to do this without the support of the research unit uh, at the Lois Hole, which is funded by uh, the Alberta uh, Women's uh, Health Foundation. So during the pandemic has been very, very tricky. So just to give you a little taste of this, we know adults born to moms with diabetes are as well at increased risk of heart and metabolic disease. And to better understand the timing of development and contributing factors, we started looking at kids from the time they were fetuses all the way through five to eight years of age. We started about 20 weeks in moms with pregestational diabetes, type one and two. And what we found is they have uh, mildly increased heart mass and left ventricular wall thickness in utero, but most importantly, even by the time they're four to six to eight weeks, that uh, they develop, they have hypertrophy that persists into childhood. So their heart muscles are already thick relative to their body surface area, relative to their size. We also found that aortic stiffness was present, not so much as brand new babies, but in late infancy and the children. This is all stuff that potentially affects that heart long term, uh, potentially affects their blood vessels long term. And we found it to correlate with mom's sugar control in that third part of pregnancy, which is really important because now we're starting to say, when exactly are those factors relevant for what happens to these children who are just innocent bystanders getting this exposure, right? But the next question was, when does this happen? Or what are the other factors after birth that might uh, affect them? Also, when we saw that sugar control late, uh, tends to be uh, what is important for aortic stiffness. We said, well, that's like gestational diabetes, not just pregestational, but gestational diabetes, which is much more common and occurs in about 10 to 14% of all pregnant women. Uh, and with this, we were awarded a, um, 
a uh, uh, Wickery and Alberta Women's Health Foundation funded innovation grant. It's master's student driven. This is Clayton Beamy, one of our master's students, along with Martha Moran, one of our fellows. This was us in Calgary last weekend doing studies on 18 kids who were born to moms uh, uh, with gestational diabetes. We have partnered with the Apron uh, investigators who had looked at over 2,000 uh, pregnant moms that were recruited about 10 to 12 years ago across Alberta. Uh, and looked at their nutrition, got lots of detail about their health and nutrition and activity in pregnancy. So uh, this is now nine to 12 years later where we're assessing these children. They also had lots of information about their health and nutrition through infancy and childhood. And we're also looking at their current activity level and their nutrition and other factors that may, may play a role to better understand exactly what factors are most important, what factors contribute and make for worse disease, and what factors might actually mitigate it along the way. So we're looking at the heart uh, and blood vessel health. We're looking at their body mass, their, their blood lipid profiles and their blood sugar and insulin, looking for any evidence of insulin resistance. So that's kind of a fun study that's currently underway. And then finally, most recently, as mentioned, we recently uh, received funding for studying uh, maternal heart disease uh, and what happens, uh, what sort of factors may be important uh, for their uh, problems in pregnancy. So we know that maternal heart disease complicates about 4% of all pregnancies. And for those moms, eight to, so these are moms who themselves have heart disease, many of whom have congenital heart disease. So from birth, eight to 10% uh, will have an obstetrical complication and, tw and some include m maternal mortality or, or demise. Uh, and some uh, almost up to a quarter will have a risk of having a fetal or newborn complication. And that includes preterm delivery, small birth weights and offspring uh, loss. And while low, we know that this affects certain uh, heart defect groups uh, more than others, as you can see here, where the more of the complications occur among a lot of our cardiac congenital heart patients, uh, uh, and the only thing that we really know is that low cardiac output has been proposed as a primary problem, but a lot of these moms don't have reduced muscle disease. So we said, what's going on and why do they develop all these problems to these babies? Can we do better? We know that before uh, that preterm birth and problems with the placenta are known to be associated with underlying vascular disease and otherwise healthy moms. So people have done a lot of studies trying to understand why do some moms have babies who are born preterm and have placenta problems and they found underlying vascular disease or vascular disease that develops within a short time after the pregnancy. We also know the vascular pathologies been identified in adults with congenital and acquired heart disease. So then we said maybe because pregnancy is an amazing thing, your body has to uh, really adapt dramatically from a vascular standpoint to be able to accommodate a healthy pregnancy and your heart needs to adapt uh, dr dramatically. And perhaps that's just not possible in moms who have heart disease and how can we change that? But you need to start with understanding why. So we think that they may, some of them have a reduced cardiac output. Uh, with abnormal heart structure or function, or the output may not be enough to deal with problems with their blood vessel health. And that blood vessel health, including in increased arterial stiffness and poor flow mediated function uh, may actually start to impact on how blood flows to the placenta, to the uterus, and ultimately the development of the placenta. So we think this is the primary mechanism. And honestly, as a pediatric cardiologist, you say, why would I be interested in this? These are adult congenital heart or adult heart disease patients. And that's because I think if we know this, at least for our congenital heart patients, we can be counseling them potentially earlier and trying to look at ways, even when they're children, Children and teenagers before they start thinking about having babies, we can get them thinking about staying healthy and what sort of things keep them healthy from a heart and blood vessel standpoint. So we're looking at 100 moms with heart disease and 100 healthy moms. Uh, we're looking at the relationship uh, and how um, a blood vessel function and how heart function changes in pregnancy uh, to look at the differences in those moms with heart disease and which of the moms seem to have uh, more of a problem in adapting. We're looking at the relationships between the heart output, vascular function, uh, ventricular arterial coupling. You know, maybe the heart function looks fine, but it's not enough for those blood vessels to overcome the blood vessel uh, dysfunction. Uh, and looking at the, the uterus and the placental function as well as how the baby's doing before birth. And this we're gonna all correlate with what's going on with respect to the outcomes of these moms. Um, and finally, interestingly enough, you know, you get this exposure before birth and these moms have babies who may in fact themselves be at risk long-term for cardiovascular disease 
as well as uh, metabolic problems because of their exposure before birth. So we're looking at those babies as well. And honestly, we wouldn't be able to do this without the support of uh, uh, the foundations uh, that provide support for the research unit, because that's how we're kind of making it through when our research nurses are being redeployed to help out uh, in strained uh, clinical areas with the pandemic. So this is just to give you a sense of the work that we're doing. So um, I will say that our research has and will continue to advance the field of prenatal diagnosis and absolutely the care we provide to women and their babies and their, and their families. And our research has definitely enhanced the training and experience of future clinical science uh, researchers from around the world, North America, from Canada, North America, and around the world. And these are just a few examples. Um, but in fact, our research has been made possible through the generous support of, of uh, the Alberta Women's uh, Health Foundation. And we are uh, uh, for sure very grateful for that. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for that, Dr. Hornberger. And that was very informative. Um, I'd like to introduce to you our next speaker, who is Dr. Tanya Berry. Tanya is a professor and associate dean of research within the Faculty of Kinesiology, Sport and Recreation at the University of Alberta. Her research focuses on automatic reactions to health promotion messages and reactions when the time is taken to think about the messages. Dr. Berry also studies how these reactions influence decisions to be physically active or not and promoting health in an increasingly busy media environment. Very interesting. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Berry. I will pass it on to you. You're still on mute. Thank you, Lisa. I heard you say that. Yes, I realized I'm on mute. Um, so I was saying, <laughs> uh, thank you. As Lisa said in her, uh, now I'm blushing, as she said in her uh, presentation that uh, it's, uh, thank you so much for the support of the Women and Children's Health Research Institute and the Lois Hole Hospital for Women. And it's incredible to see the amount of varied research uh, that is done um, from you know, what Dr. Hornberger uh, presented at one end of the spectrum and the incredibly important clinical work that she is doing and her team is doing. Uh, for a completely change of direction though, what I study, as uh, Crystal said, is the media landscape and how we, uh, how we interact within that landscape and how that influences our behaviors and how it makes us feel. So the automatic reactions that were referred to there, what I call our gut reactions are really our emotional responses and they're incredibly strong drivers of behavior. So what I want to just go over tonight is just kind of a thread of research uh, that started um, with, uh, with research that really looked at um, heart health messages in general, and regardless of their source and how they shape our perceptions of heart healthy behaviors. And this is just, again, how is the media profiling heart health? And this is February, so there's lots of stuff in the media right now. Um, but how is it <clears throat> goes, how does it go throughout the year? And how do these messages make women feel? And how can we make the messages more effective? So I'll go back in time uh, a little bit. And in about 2012, I guess, um, had some CIHR funded research. So the Canadian Institutes of Health Research that looked at the pink ribbon campaign, which we know is for breast cancer, compared to the red dress campaign for heart health in women. And just really trying to get an understanding of how those two campaigns influence perceptions of disease. And what we found among 
other things, but just for tonight, is very few articles about heart disease in Canadian media. And at the same time, we surveyed women about what they felt and thought about heart disease and found that there were really high perceptions of susceptibility to heart disease. So the message that women are at risk was getting out there. Um, and that also that there were some things that you could do to prevent heart disease. But the only health behavior that was re related to these factors was fruit and vegetable consumption. So people were really getting the message that diet is important, but the physical activity message was being uh, lost there a little bit. Um, and again, I'm in the faculty of kinesiology, sport and recreation. So my interest is very much in physical activity. So based on these findings, um, we looked at what we would call typical health behavior messages. So, sorry, I flipped. I, I got ahead of myself. There we go. Um, so then we were fortunate enough to receive some Wickery funded, um, some Wickery funding to look at heart messages for women. Uh, again, information behavior and how women seek information about heart disease and the effects on their attitudes. And this research is done with doctors Colleen Norris from the Faculty of Nursing um, and also Dr. Tammy Oliphant, who is in the School of Library and Information Studies. And what we did is interviewed many, many women, talked to many women about what they think about um, heart disease messages, about how these messages are framed. Um, so how, what they talk about in their messages um, and about health behaviors in particular, so physical activity. And what we found quite consistently was the heart disease messages left women feeling guilty um, and for being blamed for having developed heart disease in the first place. And uh, my background in physical activity messaging, I know that I've been complicit in this myself in that I've created many messages that takes what we call a goal setting approach that relies on what we call self regulatory practices. So, you know, set a goal, make a plan, these sorts of messages that we've probably all seen. And this relies on what we call reasoning uh, and conscious self regulation. So it requires people to stop and think. And again, I'm very much interested in more the emotional side of things and how emotions drive our behavior. So one example of what we might see in a typical health behavior message um, based, you know, focused on heart disease um, and which is based on cognitions or on thinking is something like this, where, you know, it just says if you do at least 150 minutes of physical activity a week, which is, of course, the Canadian uh, guidelines can reduce your risk of heart disease. That's that's true. Um, but uh, then often these messages go on to say that keep in mind that if you stop, uh, you, the gains that you make are going to very quickly be lost, typically within a few weeks. And then the tips that you see there on their screen are, are these typical goal setting self regulatory strategies. So when we presented these messages to women and asked them, you know, how do these, what do you think of them? What, what would you like to see different? Again, one of the things that uh, some of the women were saying, many of the women, in fact, was uh, self-blame. So they were seeing these messages and it was making them feel, as this woman said, embarrassed. She didn't want to tell people that she had uh, had a heart attack uh, in this case. In this particular case, this woman had had a heart attack um, because she felt that it was her fault. Um, so she didn't want anyone to know because she felt it's her lifestyle. And then she said, I'm too fat. I eat wrong. I don't exercise enough. And so I feel guilty that I think I caused it. So I would hope that none of us want to make anybody feel this way, but, and this is an unintended consequence of these messages. And then um, as another participant in some of our research said, so this literature, these typical messages that I showed you make it feel like it's a lifestyle disease. And the, um, the things they say that you should do in this case, and many of our participants would say, I'm already doing that. I'm already trying to be very careful about what I eat and, and trying to be physically active. And yet I still uh, developed heart disease. And so they just are left with this really bad feeling, uh, feeling really guilty. Um, so we took that information and said, can we actually create better messages that uh, target what we call affect? So that's kind of psychology talk for emotions um, and uh, got more funding from the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And 
this study just finished um, throughout COVID, but we compared this typical message, the message that I sh just showed you, with a message that targeted positive emotions. So that is affect, so our positive emotions. And we tried to take a storytelling approach. And this was based on previous research and other health behaviors in, in, in the area of smoking, in fact, where uh, some people were really successful in addressing smoking behavior by instead of regaling people with health statistics and telling people people how they're doing things wrong and that you know that they shouldn't be smoking and, and taking quite a quite a negative approach they told a, a positive story of somebody who was able to quit smoking and were actually quite effective in in having some influence on smoking behavior and so we took that and we created our own messages and tested the effects of that emotional message uh, compared to kind of the more typical message that you might see. And we just looked at physical activity over one week just as a preliminary test. So this is, sorry, a lot of text, but this is um, some excerpts from the, from the emotion affect based message that we uh, created. And so you can read it for yourself, but I will point out the letters, or sorry, the words that are bolded there, enjoy, relaxing, better mood, giggle. We actually went to a database of words that have been rated by thousands and thousands of people and, and selected the words that older women rated the most positively that made them the happiest essentially and so we used those words to create this story about you know a fictional person marie who found different ways um, to be physically active uh, that included going walk for a walk with a friend um, and doing things that made her smile and just doing kind of goofy things like dancing while she's doing housework. And so again, we presented these messages to uh, a number of women, both women with heart disease and also age matched controls. So women in the same age group, generally over the age of 60 years, I think our oldest participant was maybe 95. So we had quite a range um, in there, but the average age was usually in their late 70s. And again, we showed them these messages. We asked them, how do these messages make you feel? And in general, um, so the affective message, the one that I just showed you, got a lot of positive comments saying things like it improves my mood, it reduces my stress levels. The more typical cognitive message also received um, quite a few positive comments and, and women liked that it re Re, um, that it took a goal setting approach. And then they said, well, it helps me think about rewarding myself for when I have achieved a goal. There are also um, people who dislike to the affective message. And of course, we're not going to please anybody. There were far fewer negative comments, only three, um, but some of them felt that maybe the message was a little bit condescending, um, a little bit, you know, we tried to keep the language quite simple and maybe for some women it was just too simple for them and they didn't like it and that's fair enough. Um, there were also a few negative comments, again far fewer, but um, again more along the same lines of just, you know, it's just so regimented, it's a daily log. There were others still around the guilt and the blame. Um, and then interestingly with the typical message, uh, nine comments where women were saying things like, you know, I know this, I've said it, or I've heard it many, many times. So there's kind of a mix, but in general, um, the affective message was very positively received. And so what we did was we had what was called a, a, a crossover design. So within subject crossover design, so that means one week, the same women would get uh, the affective message. The next week, the same woman would get the cognitive message. And then other women saw them in a different order where some saw the cognitive message first, others saw the affective message first. And we gave them um, accelerometers, which is basically a fancy pedometer, very much like a Fitbit, if you own one of those. Um, and we just tracked their physical activity. So we asked them to put up the message, you know, they were laminated and asked them to put that somewhere that they might see it every day, like on their fridge or something, just as a reminder. Um, and, and then we just tracked and we measured a lot of different things, but I will just talk briefly about the um, accelerometry data. And on average, uh, again, this is comparing women to themselves. So they saw both messages and in a random order, some of them saw the affective message first, some of them the cognitive message first. But on average, when they had the message, the, the emotional based message um, for that week, they actually did 11 minutes more per day in light physical activity. So that's kind of housework type things um, uh, compared to when they saw the cognitive message. And that's not very much, 
but it is still important because every little bit counts. I have been asked in the past in um, when it comes to uh, if I were to give one message about physical activity, uh, you know, if I were to distill everything down that I've done over the past couple decades around physical activity, the message I would say is move a little bit and then move a little bit more. So just moving a little bit, 11 minutes per day can, can be beneficial. And in fact, previous research has shown that this light non-exercise activity, so you're not deliberately going out to exercise, you're just doing a little bit of um, housework or whatever, have have positive benefits for women's heart health so every little bit counts and then at the same time about 15 minutes less per day was spent being sedentary which again just standing up can be beneficial and just not sitting so much can be quite helpful so just to conclude um, this line of research is that messages are often the starting point for future behaviors. So when I talk to my undergraduate research or, uh, students and you know I, I start introducing these things, I always say information is necessary, but not sufficient. So you need information, you need to know what to do, but it's, it's part of a, a broad landscape. So I'm not saying that these messages are going to miraculously change uh, you know, the, the, the physical activity behavior of the world, but they are important. And so, and we absolutely need the right messages. So if, again, if we're making people feel guilty or bad, uh, we're heading in the wrong direction. So based on the research so far of what we've done, I would say we probably need a combination of sort of the story emotional type message, as well as the tips and the, and the self-regulatory strategies and you know the, the information that women still need. But can we try to create messages that aren't going to make people feel bad? And that would be my next challenge is to try to make those, those combination messages and see how they might affect, uh, affect women and women's health and women's behaviors. And most importantly, how they feel about themselves in relation to their own health. So that um, is all I wanted to uh, share with you tonight. And again, thank you so much to, um, to all the generous funders, uh, the Lois Hole Hospital, the Women and Children's Health Research Institute, the Canadian Institutes of Health Research. And you know, I talked about Tammy and Colleen, my colleagues on this and, and everybody else that I've worked with. So thank you very much. And I will stop sharing. Perfect. Thank you for that, Dr. Barry. That was very informative. So finally, I would like to pass it over to Kelly Opper, who is speaking as our patient representative this evening. Thank you, Crystal, and thank you, everybody, for inviting me to be a part of this evening. Heart health is um, a very personal subject to me and uh, my sisters. So um, I'd like to introduce you to Wendy. Uh, this is Wendy Phillips. Um, she died at 66 of massive cardiac arrest, and it could have been anticipated. It should have been anticipated. So I'm going to start at the beginning. She was an incredible woman, larger than life. She took her four daughters, her husband took them to the Yukon, raised them on the land in a bus. She had wanderlust and a sense of adventure. And Dr. Barry, she loved to giggle. Um, she had this uh, sense of being present for people in a way that made you feel like you were the most important person in the room. She uh, never missed a special occasion for any of her grandchildren, her great grandchildren. Um, and she just knew how to live life. She was just, just so much fun, um, always planning the next adventure. In fact, for her 65th birthday, she planned her very own party, including a baseball tournament, a masquerade parade, and fireworks, with nobody watching. It was in the middle of nowhere. But let me back up to when she was about 50. So my mom was diagnosed uh, with heart issues through a routine angiogram at the CK Huey, of all places. And she had gone in. Um, she lived in Edmonton in this time, and she'd gone in for a routine angiogram. And it was at that time that she, it was, she was uh, diagnosed with three blockages in her heart, 100%, 90%, and 90%. And they stented them at that time, right during that angiogram, actually. And when I went to go get her, they asked me, oh, you must be here for your, for your mother. She's the patient with a heart attack. No, no, she was just here for a routine angiogram. No, she had a heart attack. So the reason why I say this is because she had a diagnosed heart history. She had family 
heart history. Her father died of a stroke and her brother died of um, uh, heart issues as well. So fast forward about 15 years, my mom now lives in the Valley. She lives in rural Alberta. And we are at a family gathering and we're starting to notice she's just slowing down a little bit. She kind of seems a little bit more tired, but she also considered in my mind, her disease, a lifestyle disease, that it was probably something that she contributed to, that she could have done things better. Um, she loved to cook, she loved to entertain. Um, and so it's now Thanksgiving 2019, um, and uh, I get a phone call that she's going to go to the closest emergency room uh, in her, uh, near her, her uh, farm. And I get there, I meet her there. And I was told, we were told that they did not find any incidents of heart attack in her blood and that her ECG was fine and that she should go home and put her feet up and drink less coffee and reduce her anxiety. So she was actually presenting with chest pains, shortness of breath and blood pressure fluctuations. And this was all attributed to anxiety. She went home, she had a follow-up appointment with, with her family physician, also in another rural town. Not once, by the way, had her cardiologist been uh, contacted in the city. Um, I had asked for imaging, but they, it was denied. And her family physician even told her it would be okay for her to go on a trip to Mexico the next week. I'll book a, there was a follow-up appointment to happen and, uh, and that it would be okay. She could go on a trip to Mexico. I'm very glad she went to Mexico because she returned home and 12 hours later, she died of massive cardiac arrest in the middle of nowhere. Um, her symptoms seemed to be overlooked. Her family history seemed to be ignored and she really didn't know how to advocate for herself. And so what you guys have talked to about tonight, like heart messaging and it's really important. And the reason why I'm here tonight is because uh, we've had some real outcomes and takeaways, my sisters and I. Number one, um, I think the, the greatest outcome for us is that um, her family physician now refers anybody with any kind of symptoms that he's not familiar with immediately to the city. Um, he did share that with us. Um, uh, we have had feedback from friends, family, women, uh, that they are now using their voice, trusting their intuition, and asking for a second opinion. That was one of the biggest takeaways that we, we really figured out was that my mother was very afraid to get a second opinion outside of that rural physician. She was very afraid that they might hurt their feelings, not seem that it was that they didn't trust them, um, and, and that it just wasn't sort of protocol, and so they didn't. And so um, my message, our message is to just trust your intuition and ask for an opinion, a second opinion, that's okay. Um, supporting amazing organizations like the Alberta Women's Health Foundation, Wickery, the Lois Hole Hospital for Women doing incredible research like we just heard, that's really important. And making a difference. She was so committed to making a difference, excuse me. And I hope that in a small way, we can do the same. So thank you. Oh, and I have her earrings on today. So this is Wendy. Kelly, thank you so much for sharing your story. And you know, before I go into the rest of my remarks, I just wanna say that your story brings to light the importance of women advocating for themselves. And this is not just another statistic. You know, we often read and see statistics, um, you know, over 300 women in Alberta are sent home from the emergency room every year. They're actually presenting with heart attack or serious heart disease issues, and it's just being writ off, written off as anxiety, excuse me. Um, but these women are not statistics. That's not just a number. Uh, these are real women with families and loved ones and a community around them. And so, Kelly, thank you for sharing your story. Um, and thank you for, you know, your continued work and your family's continued work. Uh, around advocacy. And I think, you know, it's such a, an honor that you are with our foundation and help support the work of the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. 
um, because the Women's Alberta Women's Health Foundation is very much centered around advocacy, of course, raising dollars in order to fund more research in our community that then will in turn impact clinical care. And so we talk about a closed loop uh, circuit uh, for the Alberta Women's Health Foundation. And all three of these components are vital to moving the needle on women's health and women's health research is a cornerstone to that. I also want to say a very heartfelt thank you to uh, Dr. Hornberger and Dr. Barry. Your research is fascinating. Um, and I really love the learnings that all of us can take away from that uh, related to fetal uh, heart health. And then of course, how that impacts the moms. And then uh, of course, Dr. Barry on messaging. And I think that's so, so important and very enlightening for me on how women are going to understand and digest information and feel okay with it and not place the blame. And so what a wonderful informative evening. And you know, I'm so excited too that we were able to pull off this uh, collaboration event because the Alberta Women's Health Foundation works hand in hand with the Women and Children's Health Research Institute and the Lois Hill Hospital Women and Women's Society. And so together we're making women's health stronger um, from research, clinical care, and advocacy in our community. So thank you all for your time this evening and sharing your stories and your research. And thank you to all those who attended uh, to listen today. And so from here, I'm going to pass it on to Rianne Adams, who will facilitate our Q&A. Uh, and just want to say thank you once again, everyone. Thank you, Tegan. Um, and thank you again so much to our speakers for, for being here this evening and for teaching us and sharing with us. Um, my name is Rhiannon Adams. I am a supporter of the Lowell Hospital Women's Society and co-chair with Crystal of the Development Committee. Um, I'm going to be facilitating the Q&A portion of the evening. So um, if anyone has questions, please, um, yeah, pop them. There's a Q&A box at the bottom. Um, I can also look in the chat box as well. But um, if you have questions, please just pop them in down there. Um, and then I will read them out to our panelists. Um, I will maybe, maybe I'll get, get started. Um, there isn't anything there as of yet. Um, so why don't I ask about um, the, I guess, maybe future direction, Dr. Hollenberger, you were talking a bit about where you're going next with your um, research just earlier on when we were meeting. Do you want to talk a bit about where that's going? Well, the, the two studies that, that I had mentioned toward the end are actually ones that are just underway. Um, and that's the one on gestational diabetes and its impact on uh, health of the kids, but uh, with a really wonderful collaboration with our apron colleagues. Um, that that information we, we couldn't do such a study and always I, I have to get a sent from the kids get approval from the kids to do the studies and I'll say to them think about your mom you know would you would she remember 10 years ago what she ate during her pregnancy no no one's going to remember so uh, that's sort of fun but but having the apron study and the, the information that they gathered and those moms that were so willing to participate for so many years is wonderful the, and that other study that we're currently uh, doing sorry, one of my dogs is barking at a coyote, um, is, um, is the mom, mom's heart uh, study, which I think is really very, very important to try to optimize, improve the outcomes of these, of these moms and their pregnancies. Um, and I think, as I mentioned, as a pediatric cardiologist, understanding this is important because there are things that we can be doing even when the kids are quite young. Uh, and as teenagers, in terms of counseling about you know, making yourself as healthy as possible and doing what we can to make them as healthy as possible so they actually have uh, good, healthy pregnancies and their kids uh, are healthy, so. Okay, thank you. Um, uh, Dr. Barry, do you want to maybe talk, or can I ask you a question, I guess, about um, the, the next steps in what you are doing um, a bit more and just maybe talk to us about, about what's happening next? Yeah, so as I kind of alluded to at the end, the both messages had kind of different responses. Um, and so it's a real challenge to try to continue to craft these messages and, and try to make them publicly available and partnering with organizations like the Heart and Stroke to, to, to be able to give important information about how to increase your physical activity again through some that self-regulatory stuff, but also 
again, how to not make people feel guilty. So, you know, we're trying to work on creating those messages and again, working with, um, with the target audience, with women with heart disease to say, you know, what, what, would help you and what what information do you want and often when women um you know especially first diagnosis maybe are overwhelmed and so it's great like perhaps you know family members can come and you know you're just getting so much information and it's just so overwhelming and, and that stress response can really affect how we think and how we feel so how can we lower that stress response both in the moment of you know at the point of of diagnosis and when you're kind of in shock and you're you're going through that and then also later on um when uh, when you're in perhaps rehabilitation or something like that so we're still kind of working on how to craft the better messages, I guess. Yeah, I know we, um, at an earlier session this year, talked about health at every size and sort of the messaging. I think it was somewhat similar. It's my my fault or, you know, it's my weight or it's me and whatever has happening is because of what I'm doing and, and that's, you know, not helpful at all. Do you, um, do you work in collaboration with, with people sort of in that area? Um, who are talking about health at every size and, and that stuff where, um, yeah. Yeah, I feel like you're talking to one of my former doctoral students, Maxin Mir. So I have a whole line of research looking at uh, weight bias and physical activity settings. Um, so sort of the similar thing, like how how are people and not just women in this case but how are they impacted by physical activity messaging and being told that there is a certain body that should be physically active and other bodies shouldn't be physically active which of course is completely incorrect um and so reducing that um you know just the the images that we show and the bodies that we show that are that are supposedly healthy can be quite tight like the bodies can be diverse, but we only show a very narrow, um, narrow range. So I think that there's a lot of overlap between the health at any size um, and between how we talk to anybody about their health behaviors, including uh, women um, who may be, you know, uh, getting older and maybe are beginning, becoming worried about their heart health, even though they haven't had a diagnosis. Although, as we just heard from Kelly, you know, you may very well have some, uh, have some <clears throat> signs that are that are being ignored. And so how are you addressing those? And then all the way through to post-diagnosis and, and what messages can we give them? Thank you. Um, Dr. Hornberger, there is a question that has come in for you from um, the panel or from the, <laughs> the attendees. Um, so someone is asking, are you involved with interventions when problems are found while in utero? So I have in the past, we, and I think that the person's probably thinking about aortic or pulmonary like valve dilations before birth. Um, and those are sort of the really exciting areas, although they're for a very, very, very small percentage of the babies that we see. Uh, I was involved when I was at UC San Francisco um, Fetal Treatment Center. Uh, we come across those babies pretty rarely and they get referred to Toronto because that's really the bigger they need. It's, it's important that the centers that are doing that get the most cases so that they stay really uh, good and that it's better not to have little prog all the little programs actually trying to do it themselves. But there's lots of other ways that we're involved from an intervention standpoint. So we give moms medicines, for instance, when the babies have abnormal rhythms uh yeah both fast and slow and that can make them much healthier um and result in a much healthier pregnancy including the ability you know sometimes we have uh abnormal rhythms that um result in the moms needing a cesarean section and we really try hard to make it possible for moms to have a regular delivery so just treating even right before the delivery can sometimes be enough uh for the babies then to have a normal rhythm and have a regular delivery so that's that's one way in which we really try our best to have the babies be as healthy as possible and then the moms have a healthy uh, delivery. We also give medicines when there's heart failure in the baby um, and there are other ways in which uh, we're involved with uh, interventions along that line. I'm wondering if um, if there's resources that um, people may be able to, I mean if you get some news and it's not necessarily what you're expecting as you're pregnant um, and people start Googling, which is 
never a good thing. Um, are there resources or, or locations that you would direct people to um, when, you know, they have come in and, and there's maybe something that's not quite right about their, their baby's heart? Yeah, one well, has to always be careful because it's always hard and it really, you know, the outcomes depend on some of the nuances of the heart, which might not be so readily apparent if someone's not um, comfortable with the medical lingo and that sort of thing. So we often will discourage them from doing that as much as possible. But but uh, the Fetal Heart Society has a website and we're working on, uh, which I, I'm one of the board members, um, and we're kind of evolving really good um uh, information for families for various different conditions. Um, there's also, uh, we use a, a booklet as an example that gives you at least some more information about a prenatal diagnosis, what it means, what sort of options you have, um, you know, how do you tell your family, how do you, you know, those sort of things. Um, so it's more than just even the heart disease and the clinical outcomes. There's a lot more that goes with it. It's a pretty emotional time for families and can be very, very difficult. Um, um, there, there are also other foundations and other, other programs like, uh, the, the Children's Heart Foundation has also information for families uh, and other resources like that. But yeah, uh, reading the literature or reading Dr. Google isn't always the best thing. And sometimes we, we usually just really discourage them from doing too much, um, just because it can make them frightened when it may not be necessary or, and, 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 and other, you know, provided misinformation. Absolutely. Um, Kelly, I have a question for you. Um, what would be your main, like maybe the top three things you would say to someone who um, maybe is concerned about uh, whether or not they're being heard? Um, yeah. I think from a woman's perspective or from mine and my sisters, we'd say trust your intuition. Um, I think that's a really good diagnostic tool for women. And I think that's it's often overlooked as just your basic intuition. Um, when something doesn't feel right, you know, it's okay to go and get it checked out. Um, use your voice. I think that that's something that uh, I, that is really a message that my sisters and I want to convey is that how you need to be an advocate for yourself and use your voice. We still wonder why when everybody around my mother could clearly see that she was not doing well, like she was hunched over <laughs> and had labored breathing, but yet in her mind, everything was fine. And that was because she was told that. And so use your voice, trust your intuition and support women's health. Those would be my three things. Thank you. Um, okay, I don't see any other questions. Oh, maybe there is one coming in, sorry. Okay, yeah, so I don't see other, any other questions coming in right now. So what I'm going to do, um, is come down to the last sort of part of our, our session this evening. Um, so again, I want to take the opportunity to, uh, from the bottom of our hearts, being heart month, it's, yeah, um, for taking part in this evening um, and for continuing everyone who's participating and here to, to make this online event um, and community just amazing. Um, <clears throat> <laughs> good one uh i'm trying to make it funny from from now on again um so if you'd like to support the women's society we'd love for you to consider donating or becoming a member um if you haven't already become a member you can visit our website uh, i think it'll probably go up in the chat box at the bottom but it's um lhhwomensociety.com um, or you can reach out to any of us with any questions. Uh, and I know when we have that wrap up email, you can always um, connect with Paula if you have questions as well. So uh, also thank you very much to those who donated this evening. Um, and uh, for those of you who are here who are monthly, uh, monthly supporters, so thank you very much. I thank you to Alberta Blue Cross for sponsoring What the Health. Um, we sort of, as we mentioned at the beginning, we have a feedback survey that will be sent out shortly. Um, and if you fill it in, you'll be entered to win a draw for a $25, a $25 gift card from our friends at Alberta Blue Cross. Um, and if you are the winner, you will be contacted by a representative um, and it will not be a phishing scam. Um, so yeah, 
answer. Um, uh, so thank you, Alberta Blue Cross, for that. Our next lecture is going to be held on March the 24th, uh, Gannett from 7 to 8.30. Um, and we are going to be talking about cognitive decline at that point. Um, thank you very much for attending and, uh, and have a wonderful rest of your evening. Thank you. Thanks again for having us. Have a good night. Yeah, uh, thank you so Thanks, much, guys. Bye. Bye. Bye.